Okay, now that it's it's 402, so I'll, I'll go ahead and get us started. Um, so I'm I'm really excited to meet to introduce our speaker for today, um, Jose from um, from Cal Poly Humboldt. Um, I was really lucky to get to meet Jose last uh, last year around this time at the Coast meeting where he was part of a panel on thinking about community engagement and science. Um, it was really great to hear all the work that he's doing up at Humboldt, some of which he's going to talk to you guys about today. I know that as part of his talk, he is going to tell you a bit about his path through science or path to where he is, so I'll be brief in his introduction. Um, Jose is originally from, from Ecuador, um, from Guayaquil, and then he came to the United States, to Oregon, to do his master's at University of Oregon, and then a PhD at Oregon State University. Um, after that, he was a postdoc at uh, Central Michigan University, where he looked at larval dispersal patterns of fishes. And then he returned to Ecuador, where he was a uh, postdoc. I can't remember where right now, but then he worked uh, as a fisheries biologist at the Charles Darwin Foundation. Um, so I'm excited to hear his talk today about some of the stuff that he's working on with Odalith and training students. Um, and I'll let Jose take it from here. Thank you, Allison. Um, and thank you for your kind introduction. Um, just in case, can everyone hear me okay? Maybe a thumbs up. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Katie. So, thank you. So, I'm going to quick share my screen. Okay. Hopefully, everyone can see it. Yep. Looks like it's being streamed. Okay. So, my talk is a little different in that um, because it's very community based research, I've organized my talks in that way so that um, we highlight not just the research that we've done, but the people that we're working with. So just bear that in mind. And I'd like to start by explaining why I have so many last, so many names, um, just because this is a confusion that I often find. Um, and so you'll notice that my first name is Jose, and the little accent over the E is called a tilde in Spanish. Um, it tells the reader where the accent should go. So in this case, it's Jose, the accent on the E, not Jose, right? In, in case it didn't have um, a tilde. I have a middle name. We don't need to go into it. It's not very pretty. Anyways, um, and then you notice two last names. This is very common for Latinx people. Um, the first one, Marin, comes from our fathers. Harin comes from our mothers. Um, and so in, in my case, my children are Marin Skydeman. Um, our K through 12 teachers hate it because you can imagine it, they require a very long uh, piece of paper to write out their last names. But anyways, um, I'm from Cal Poly Humboldt and you might notice that in the photo, it says Humboldt State University. That's because that was what we used to be. And Katie introduced, um, excuse me, Allison introduced where I'm from and what I've done. Um, and I'd like to revisit that just a little bit um, in what um, Escala, who's a group I'll talk about in a little bit, refers to as the cultural journey, uh, because I think this will provide with some context for why we have directed our research in the way that we have. So my journey, um, and by the way, my pronouns are he, el, pai, he, el is he in Spanish and pai is he in Quechua, which is a traditional language um, in the area of the world where I'm from. And that is from Ecuador. I was originally, I'm originally from coastal Ecuador, um, born in 1980. Um, so Ecuador is way in the bottom. You can see it here, right? We're not very creative with our names. Ecuador after the line of the equator. Um, and this is me in the photo on my grandfather's arms. Um, and remember I mentioned we're not very creative. My name is Jose, my father who's kneeling next to us, his name is Jose, my grandfather's name is Jose, and my great-grandfather's name is Jose. Even my um, sister is Maria Jose. So not very creative in that sense. Um, to the point where when our son was born, my mom asked, asked if I was gonna name him Jose and she, she didn't want us to. And of course we, we did not because it was, it was too confused. So anyways, um, I was born in Ecuador at age two. My dad got into grad school in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And so we moved to Ann Arbor for a couple of years there. Um, this is me, my sister, and my dad in Ann Arbor. Um, after two years, he finished his program. We went back. 
um, in Ecuador, my mom graduated. She had a uh, she did a major in naval engineering. Um, she was actually the first woman to get this degree in uh, Guayaquil, um, in Ecuador in general. Um, and it's very interesting to talk to her and hear all the difficulties she had, mostly from faculty, male faculty, that uh, really did not like the fact that she was a woman in naval engineering. So this is something I think about a lot when I work with my students, right, of all the difficulties that many of us have had to endure, um, the, and not just culture, right, not just sex, but so many other reasons. So um, this is something that always comes with me. So anyways, three years in Ecuador again, Dad got into grad school again, so we moved to Michigan again for three years. He finished his degree. Um, we came back. I went to high school and undergrad in Ecuador at the University of Guayaquil. Um, this is a van. None of us had cars. Um, we all took the bus, but every now and again, we would take a road trip. Um, for whatever reason, we kept renting this same van. It kept breaking down, and we had to keep push starting it every time. Um, but anyways, it uh, leaves really cool pictures that reminds us of the crazy things we did back then. Um, after undergrad, I was a K through 12 uh, teacher for two and a half years. Um, but after that, I got a scholarship to go to grad school. So um, I moved to Oregon. I did master's and PhD there. Um, like Allison was saying, University of Oregon, which are the ducks, and Oregon State University, which are the beavers. So therefore, me and several other folks who have gone to both the universities call ourselves platypus. Um, anyways, it's, it's, we just found it amusing. But in Oregon, besides grad school, or more importantly, I met my wife, Michelle, and we had a daughter. Her name's Lucy, who, and she's 11 now. Um, after finishing PhD, we moved to Michigan. Um, we had Um, it was two great years. Um, I met, missed the ocean. And because of my scholarship, I was a Fulbright scholar. I was required to go back to Ecuador for at least two years. Um, and so first we moved to coastal Ecuador. I was a postdoc there, um, Escuela Superior Politécnica del Litoral. Um, I enjoyed my family and we are a stereotypical um, Ecuadorian family. We call family our extended family. So aunts, uncles, cousins, everyone, right? Um, this is about a third of my family. Um, uh, but you can imagine um, it's a very fun, very loud gatherings. Um, after a year on coastal Ecuador, I was recruited out to the Galapagos, to the Charles Darwin Research Station. We spent two and a half years there. I was the principal investigator for the fisheries program. Um, and after that time, um, we actually made it to California. And the reason I'm telling you all of this is to give you an idea of where I come from but also what has influenced my career and my research. In particular, the time in Galapagos was quite eye-opening. Um, we published a lot while we were there, as you can imagine. Um, we published in pretty much all ranges of journals from pretty uh, worldwide to very regional. Um, and what was difficult was despite how much we published, I felt we accomplished very little in moving management and decision-making. And what I came to the conclusion is that this was partly because a lot of the research that we did was very was only only included academics. It was almost a, an academic exercise, if you will. And so that really influenced me into trying to include our community in every part of our research. So a little bit of that, right? So in Galapagos, like I said, we moved to Cal Poly Humboldt in Arcata. Um, and let me tell you a little bit about the university. Um, it is a very diverse place. Um, we are a small university. It's about 7,000 students. We are, I think, the second smallest in the CSU system. Um, but we have a very diverse student body. 50% of our students are first-generation college students. 46% are Pell Grant recipients. And 35% are Latinx. Um, this makes us an HSI institution, um, which we have been since 2013. And 1% of our students are Native Americans, which sounds like very little, but it's actually the highest in the whole CSU system. The picture on the bottom right is actually a picture of our building. This is the Wildlife and Fisheries Building. So it's a very pretty place, as you can see. 
Now, one of the things that we, um, that myself and many faculty before me have realized is that the Northern American higher education learning environments tend to be biased towards low context, individualistic cultural frameworks. And I'll explain what I mean by low context in a second. But what this means is that students from high context cultures, such as Latinx students, basically have to learn how to learn, right? We're teaching them in ways that are foreign to them. And so they must learn to adapt, to survive, to succeed in this different environment. And because we teach them in a way that is alien to them, we have it's partly led to equity gaps in the success rates. So these are dates, excuse me, these are data on graduation rates um, in four and six years for Latinx in green and European American in blue. You have year on the x-axis from 2010 to 2015. And what you can see is that the graduation rates go up and down throughout the years, but the gap between these two groups persists. The gap is about 10 percentage points, regardless of how of what's happening in the world, basically. So this tells us that that equity gap is historical and persists over time. So let's think about what that high, low context culture terms mean. Um, so this, a simple way of thinking about it is that this is a gross generalization of the differences in our cultures. I, and I mean gross because each person is a unique um, individual, right? It's a unique organism. But um, if we were to group them by culture, this is one way. It's based on whether you are a low or high context culture. So um, this is the range that it includes, right? On the low context side, our uh, countries are people from countries like the US, um, the Netherlands, Australia, Canada, Germany, Finland, Denmark, Poland, and the UK. And when we say the US, it's really mostly meaning European Americans in the US. Um, Latinx, African Americans, Native Americans tend to be on the, on the right side, so on the high context culture side. On this right side, we have countries from, uh, with languages that are in the Romance group, like Spain, Italy, and France in Europe, and South America. And farther on the right, we have Asian and African countries. So why are we different? How are we separated? It has more than just to do with the color of our skin or the language that we speak or the foods that we eat. It has a lot to do with how we learn, basically how we live. So a few of the characteristics that are different. In the communication side, Low context cultures tend to be very specific, detailed, and precise. If you think about it, English is a very precise language. It is very well suited for Western, uh, Western science type approaches. But folks that are very low context tend to be um, poor at decoding unspoken messages, particularly when we use our body language. As opposed to this, right, the high context culture folks, um, their communication tends to be less direct. A little more flowery is often the term. So for example, if you've ever read a novel by um, Isabel Allende, for example, the Ch Chilean author, right? She's very uh, verbose, very um, adjective full, um, uh, and, and very uh, uh, likes to describe everything that's happening around her. So not as direct in our communication, but it emphasizes our human relations. So a few examples of this. Um, I had never heard of the phrase, overextending our visits until I moved to the US. That is not something we say in Ecuador and in many Latinx countries, right? For us, our visit lasts until we finish sharing. And you can't put a time to that. And so it's one example of how we value our, our human interactions. Another one is my mom talks about how the first time we got an invitation to go to a birthday party in Michigan, she was so surprised by the fact that it not only said where and what time the party started, but also the time the party ended. This is not something that we do in our country. Again, because the objective of the party is to exchange information and to share, and you can't put a time to that. It's not better, it's not worse, it's just different, right? Um, and we are more sensitive to nonverbal uh, cues. So you 
even though we're over Zoom, you might have noticed I move my hands a lot. I uh, move my head a lot. Um, when I teach, I'm pacing around and using my body to explain what I mean. This is very common in high contact culture. So again, the point is that we are different, not just in the color of our skin and the languages that we speak and the foods that we eat. It, even in things like our learning styles are different. Now, the problem with that is that how, what do you do in places like Cal Poly Humboldt, where a very large proportion of our students are high context culture, but a larger proportion of our faculty are low context culture. So the way that we tackled it was to partner with an institution called Escala, uh, which is a professional development organization that looks to provide um, this professional development opportunities for HSI practitioners like what we have here. Escala has been around for about 10 years. Um, and at Cal Poly Humboldt, they have trained over 60 educators um, that travel to New, Me to New Mexico, where they take week-long trainings. And then they come back and they develop projects. The idea is that they identify places in their teaching where Latinx students are, are suffering and then they make changes, and then they measure how well that helped their teaching. Dr. Melissa Salazar is the founder of Escala, and if you're interested, uh, their website is on this link. Now, the problem for us is that the, this partnership was funded by grants, as you can imagine, and so the university found the need to institutionalize this idea. And so that's where Creando Conciencia was born. This was a partnership with Escala to develop our own internal program. Dr. Uh, Margarita Otero Diaz, myself, and several other faculty um, took place in this, Rafael um, and Brandeling. Um, and the idea is to create awareness of our strengths as a Hispanic serving institution in order to provide a culturally sustaining environment. So th these are two ways in which we have tackled these differences, right, in order to strengthen our teaching. So how have we worked with the community and with our diverse student body in our lab? So first, let me introduce you to our, uh, our participants our lab members. So we have two graduate students who have already finished, Madeleine and Katie, our recent graduates of our program. And then Z, Lily, Sarah, and Noah, our current graduate students. We also have a recent undergraduate that finished his program, Gabe, who stayed with us as our tech. And then Michelle Skideman is our research associate and lab manager, and you might recognize her. She's also my spouse. And a lot of my previous work during graduate school was on Sandy Beach surf zones. And when I arrived in California, there was a big need for research in this area as well. So a lot of our work as a lab is on Sandy Beach surf zone fish. So let me provide a little bit of background on these very large environments. The first thing to know is that they are very large. They encompass at least 50% of the world coastline and it is over 60% in the Pacific Northwest. Um, these environments are open to the water that's coming in through waves, right? But it is semi-enclosed to the organisms. That means that organisms have adapted to exhibit behaviors that allow them to stay in the surf zone if they choose to, or not to come into the surf zone if they choose to as well. And the way to think of them is that they extend from the shoreline all the way to the outermost breaker because some surf zones have just one breaker, others have multiple. So on the bottom, you're seeing a, a, a fairly uh, basic diagram of most Sandy Beach surf zones. So on the bottom, let me see if I can get my pointer. Here we go. So you may be walking on the beach here, right? Hopefully with a dog. And if you look offshore, you see waves coming in through what is referred to as the return flow. That water that piles onshore has to go somewhere, right? If the sand is fairly thin, it can't go into the sediment, so it has to go sideways. And when it goes sideways, it forms what are called longshore currents. That longshore current 
provides water to what are referred to as the rip currents that allow for the water to go back offshore. And so you can imagine this movement of water inshore and offshore produces cells that are often uh, taken advantage of by different organisms. It's also why um, if you ever swim in the ocean, they've told you not to swim against the rip current towards shore, right? To swim sideways instead, because that will lead you into the return flow um, where the waves will push you onshore. So again, very basic description of what sandy beach surf zones are like. Now, besides a very dynamic environment, they are uh, an important habitat for several fish species, some of which are of commercial and cultural importance. Um, and these fish are there because they provide an abundant supply of, of potential prey. And the hypothesis was that they are sheltered from predators. Most of our data su supports the fact that it's probably not as safe as we thought a, a little while ago, but that hypothesis still holds. And then besides in habitat, it also provides other ecosystem services like nutrient cycling, wildlife support, water filtration, and even nursery habitat for many fish and invertebrates. So the, this is a nice um, panel of photographs published by Old et al. in 2017. It really highlights a lot of the um, benefits, but also a lot of the challenges that Sandy Beach Surf Zones um, experience. So on the top left in panel A, you can see a large fish, in this case, a shark that's coming into the surf zones to feed, right? This is one of those um, issues with that hypothesis that surf zones provide a shelter from predators because it turns out large fish do come into surf zones. They might not stay for very long periods of time, but they're definitely there. The, even though they're dynamic, they have a high biomass of fish, as you see in panel B, which is exploited right, as a resource by many fishers, both as a recreational uh, form right, in panel C or in a co commercial form in panel D. And this is because a lot of people want to live close to the coast, right? And the numbers are increasing um, with time. Um, and that leads to large development, as you can see in panel E. And of course, people require resources um, and uses, which might lead to exploitation of beaches, uh, but also modification of habitat, which might lead us to have to um, add sediment to our beaches um, or even clean them. And I clean them, I should say, um, with quotes, because this means eliminating things like kelp, um, which is not really garbage, right? It's food for many different organisms, um, which are then passed on uh, via the food chain. So I mentioned fishes are of economic and cultural importance. They're also ecologically important, right? This is a nice trophic dynamics figure from Allen et al. in 2006, um, where you can see the different types of fish and how they might in, uh, um, interact. They're also of commercial importance, both for recreational and commercial fishers, as you see here. This is actually one of our um, student anglers uh, fishing for a red tail surf perch. And then they're also of cultural importance. Um, in the Pacific Northwest, Native American tribes have fished um, on these beaches for time immemorial, right? Um, and what's interesting is that some of the species of fish that they have uh, fish for have changed over time in part because of the impact of migration of European and European Americans, right, um, that forced them to leave their lands and to change their, uh, their traditions. So, for example, one of the species that we studied, night smelt, is not something that they traditionally fished because this species comes on shore at night, which is dangerous, right, if you're sampling in Sandy Beach surf zones, or in this case, fishing. They used to fish during the day for surf smelt. But because it was dangerous for them to come to the beach during the day, they switched to fishing at night. But anyways, on the picture on the bottom, you see the Tolawa, uh, or members of the Tolawa Dini Nation. Um, they would camp on the beaches, fish, and then dry the fish on the beach um, in order to be able to be stored for the winter time. Okay. Like all habitats, sandy beaches have multiple threats. Um, this is a nice plot from the Feo et al. Um, what you're seeing here is the spatial impact on the x-axis in kilometers and time on the y-axis. The idea is that different impacts have 
different sizes in their impact, right, both in space and time. So for example, a person driving their ORV on the beach has a very small impact both in space, right, because they can't drive very far, but also in time because the damage that they create is also um, not very long lived, right? In a matter of months, the species or the organisms can rebound. But there are different uh, impacts, right? So coastal engineering and urban development, think of jetties on the mouths of estuaries, right? Can stay there for decades, if, if not centuries, and impact water movement, sediment movement, organism movement uh, for decades or even centuries. Now, the problem, of course, is that we are all being impacted by climate change. And if you remember, um, sandy beaches are fairly broad habitat, right? 50% of the world's coastline. And this has led many managers to think, well, it's okay if we lose one beach to human development because we've got so much of it. The problem is climate change has changed that equation, right? All sandy beaches are impacted by sea level rise, for example. All sandy beach surf zones are impacted by increasing wave height. And so this has led more and more managers to need information on what inhabits sandy beach surf zones, including in California. Now, one tool at the disposition of all managers is our marine protected areas. And as you probably already know, right, the state passed the Marine Life Protection Act or MLPA in 1999, which required the creation of, or basically the doubling of marine protected areas throughout the coast of California. So in the span of five years from 2007 to 2012, we basically doubled the number of MPAs from 63 to 124. And in the span of 10 years, researchers are required to monitor and to evaluate how well these um, MPAs are doing. The idea behind this 10 year uh, time period is that that's what has been found to be needed in order for um, MPAs to, to start providing benefits. Now, as you can imagine, these MPAs are placed in all the different types of habitat that we, that we have on the California coast, including on sandy beaches. Now, besides the human component, there is, of course, an oceanographic component to sandy beach surf zones. And I'm going to show you a series of panels on different environmental variables that are impacting sandy beach surf zones um, on our coast. So I'm going to show you the first one so that you have an idea of what they're going to look like. And then I'm going to bring uh, the, the rest of them. So this is sea surface temperature throughout the years from 2010 to 2022, which is the time uh, during which the, these MPAs were being created and also the time during which we have been doing our research. Um, so you have sea surface temperature in this case on the y-axis, right, year on the x-axis. The red line are the annual average data points, and the blue line is the average uh, data for this time period. So you can see that during these last 12 years, temperatures have fluctuated between 11 and 13 degrees Celsius off of our coast. So other variables that are really important in our, on, uh, for this environment are wave height, for example, that has varied between two and two and a half meters. So big waves, basically, um, and this is something we see year round. Spring transition, which is the day in which conditions change from mostly downwelling conditions to upwelling conditions. And I'm sure you're all familiar with this, right? But upwelling is what allows for the high nutrient levels that occur off of our coast. Um, the strength of the upwelling is often measured in different indexes. One is upwelling anomaly. Um, and the way to measure this or to think of this is that the more negative, the stronger the upwelling was during that year, the more positive, the, uh, the weaker the upwelling was. Um, and this varied from uh, minus 60 to about 40. And then the PDO, which is an index um, that includes things like sea surface temperature, sea, sea height, um, and many other variables to encompass or to understand better the oceanographic conditions off of our coast. And again, um, the way to think about it is, is that um, better ocean conditions for our neck of the woods are negative, um, poorer ocean conditions for our neck of the woods are more positive. So again, you can see that it fluctuated between minus six and around five um, it, but, it, during this time period. And I'm gonna ask you to focus on two specific um, areas here between 2014 and 15 are times when we had data, but are also, you may notice, very different conditions. So if you look at the sea surface temperature, 
Um, in both of these years, we had fairly high surface temperatures. Um, wave height was about average. Spring transition was about average. But then if you start to look at upwelling anomaly, especially 2015, was very positive, which again are not good conditions for things like salmon and rockfish. And then the PDO was also uh, positive, again, poor conditions for things like rockfish and salmon. The other period I'd like you to focus on is between 2020 and 2022. This again are times when we do have data. And if you look at sea surface temperature, again, different than in the previous one, right now we, the averages are below um, the, the running mean. Wave height are for the most part pretty average, except in 2022 when values started to drop. Spring transition was kind of all over the place, but in general, on average, the same for upwelling anomaly. But if you look at the PDO, for the most part, during these three years was negative, especially in 2022. Again, these are times that we were um, in the field collecting data, which is why we're going to focus on. The other reason I'd like you to focus on this time period, in particular 2014 and 15, is because we had a very large marine heat wave, which was nicknamed the blob, which was followed in 2016 by an El Nino event. The marine heat wave, the blob, started in the fall of 2013, and it's basically the winds, um, because of high, uh, high pressure event, the winds turned off, water basically became stagnant, allowed for sun to heat up the, the sea surface, um, and that increased temperatures sometimes up to four degrees Celsius in certain times and during in certain places. Um, this affected the whole North and Eastern Pacific, um, including off of our coast. So just to point this out, this red arrow is pointing to where we are in Northern California. You can see that those really red colors um, in continental US. So that was what impacted us for almost three years. Now, during this time, of course, climate change didn't stop. In fact, we know that these events are probably produced in, in large part because of climate change, right? But besides these changes in sea surface temperature, we also are experiencing sea level rise and increasing wave height. And all of these effects, of course, influence the community that inhabits our waters. Um, this is a picture of from the Northwest Fisheries Science Center. Um, and this is about the time that those pyrosomes started to show up in our catches, including off of the coast of Oregon and Washington. So those pyrosomes are these. Um, uh, cucumber-like organisms that are on the bottom. Okay, with all that in mind, let me take you through two research projects that we are carrying out in, in our lab. Um, and these research projects are in collaboration with two tribal nations, the Tolawa Deni de de Nation and the Resigini Rancheria. And we are collaborating with the state um, with CDFNW and um, with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And this is research that was funded by the California Sea Grant and CSU Coast. And it's mostly the master's research project uh, for Katie Terhar and Noah Ankel for one project and Zizanobia for the other. Um, and you can imagine we have a lot of collaborators, as you can see here, and a lot of field techs and volunteers, as you can see on the bottom as well. So these two research projects are geared towards two different surf zone fish. The first is the red-tailed surf perch. This is a very coastal species. And when I say coastal, I mean they don't want to go any deeper than 10 meters in depth. Like most surf perch, they are viviparous. That means that they have internal fertilization, and the females then give live birth in areas close to shore. They can live up to 10 years, according to the literature, but most of our research suggests that it's probably no more than six years. And they're fairly big for a fish. They get up to 41 centimeters in total length. The second species is night smelt, or Spirincus starxi. This is also a nearshore species, but can live offshore. Um, they're oviparous. That means that they have external fertilization, and the males and the females uh, release their gametes into the surf swash, where there's uh, external fertilization, 
the eggs stick to the sediment, and then they hatch eventually um, after a couple of weeks. These fish live much less, no more than three years, and are much smaller, no bigger than 23 centimeters in total length. These are both important um, cultural species for the tribal nations in our area. They're considered key indicator species for some of the tribal nations um, in coastal uh, uh, Northern California. The data that we have for both species is a little different and we sampled for them uh, in a slightly different way. So the objectives of both of these projects are a little different. So let me take you through them. For red tail surf perch, we have data from 2014 and 15 and from 2020 to 2023. Um, and we are sampling in marine protected areas in, and what we call reference sites. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a second. So because of that, we are looking at the status of the population and how it's changing over time and the benefit of marine protected areas for this fish species. In nice smelt, we only have data for tw from 2014 and 2021, but we have a wider number of sites in Humboldt and in Del Norte County, which is the one that's right below Oregon, um, the state of Oregon. And basically what we are doing in these two projects is that we are comparing catch per unit effort, fish total length, weight, age, and sex ratio. And I must say we're a little cheating on, this, on the aging part. We're using odorless analysis, but in both cases, we are very lucky in that they can both be surface red. That means that after extracting and cleaning, um, we put them under the microscope, we put them in glycerin, and we are able to read the, the rings directly from the otolith. So we don't have to polish, we don't have to cut, we don't have to burn, which are a different methods that um, you might use in otolith analysis. Um, like I said, we had different sites for the red tail surf perch. We have two MPAs that we're sampling, um, Reading Rock and uh, Samoa, and two reference sites. Um, that's Gold Bluffs and Marid, M Mad River County Beach. We refer to them as reference sites because they are physically similar to the two MPAs that we are sampling now. For the Nice Smell Project, we are sampling six different beaches along the Humboldt County and even in Del Norte County, um, we have one beach. Like I said, we're sampling in a slightly different way. For red tail surf perch, we mostly use hook and line fishing. Um, we hire student workers to carry out this research. Um, they sample from May through August um, at high tide, one hour before and one after, and one hour after. For night smelt, the work is done at night from March to September um, for at least one hour after, um, during an outgoing night tide. Okay, um, you're probably asking for some results by now. So I've told you about these projects side by side. Now I'm gonna separate them. First, I'm gonna talk about the red tail part. Then I'll talk about the night smell part. So results, and they're going to go in the same order. CPUE, length, weight, um, age, and sex ratio. So let's get started with uh, red tail CPUE. So I'm gonna show you sites or here on the x-axis and then the, uh, the, the y variable will be our response variable, of course. In this case, it's CPUE or catch per angler per hour. And what we found after five years of data is that Reading Rock, which is the MPA, had significantly higher number of fish than Mad River or Samoa, which is one is an MPA, the other one's a reference site. And we found more fish during 2022 than the other four years. In particular, more than statistically, more than 2020 and 2014. Now let's look at total length. Again, sites on the x-axis, now total length on the y-axis. Um, and we found, this time we found that Gold Bluffs and Reading Rock, so one MPA and one reading, one uh, reference site had larger fish or longer fish than in Mad River, which was the other reference site and that the fish were longer in 2021 than 2020. And the fishes were on average um, about 27 to 28 centimeters in total length. Let's look at weight. So again, 
sites on the x-axis, weight now on the y-axis, um, the fishes were around um, 300 grams in total, and they were heavier in Gold Bluffs and Reading Rock, so those two northern sites again, than Mad River and Samoa at this time. So the two northern sites had bigger fish than the two southern sites in Humboldt County. And they were heavier in 2021, which was the same as the, the longer fish in, 2000, in, um, in the previous slide, than the fish collected in 2022 or 2020. Now let's look at um, sex ratio. And here, instead of using box plots, I'm showing you the total number of fishes that were either male or female um, per site on the x-axis, um, the number of fishes on the y-axis. And what we found was that there was usually always more males um, in these different sites, except at the Mad River site, where there was significantly more females than males. When we looked at year, we also found that in general, we had more males than females, except in 2015, where we caught more females than males. And in this case, you see um, males in blue and females in the green box. Finally, let's look at age. And this time they're stacked um, bar plots. Um, you have year, excuse me, site on the x-axis again and number of fish on the y-axis. Um, and it goes from baby blue, meaning younger ages, which is one-year-olds, all the way to purple, which means six-year-olds. And what we found was that Reading Rock, that farther site, had old, the oldest fishes. The six-year-olds were only present in Reading Rock. But if you look at all of the four sites, we had fishes that were from one to six-year-olds with a large mode of between three and four-year-olds. When we look by year, again, we see this broad range of ages, and I should point out we didn't have data, age data for 2014 and 15, um, but the oldest fishes were found in 2022 when we had fishes that were between two and six-year-olds. So what does this tell us? It tells us that between 2012, excuse me, 2014 and 2022, for the most part, the population of uh, this species of fish seems to be stable, and there seems to be little benefit of the MPAs uh, for this particular species. The reasons are unclear, but they could be due to low fishing pressure, the fact that these fish live long enough that even poor ocean conditions, even three years of poor ocean conditions can be uh, doable for this species, and in part because they are viviparous, right? So they're they don't have to, their larvae, their young, don't have to deal with poor ocean conditions offshore, only with what the conditions are present in the uh, surf zones. What our data also showed is that those two northern sites, Reading Rock um, and Gold Bluffs, had longer, heavier, and older fish. Now, this is not unreasonable. These northern sites are also farther away from towns. So even though we have lower fishing pressure, the fishing pressure should be stronger, closer to town than farther away from town, right? People are less likely to drive to these distant uh, uh, beaches to fish. Therefore, they're functioning as an MPA um, just because they're far away enough. There, are, there is also some differences in beach structure um, and slope and also on nearby habitat. Now, these data are really interesting, right, for, from our perspective, but for managers, they would be, they could be useful for uh, monitoring and aging methodology um, and MPA effectiveness. So one example is that Mad River site where we found more females um, could mean that there is a, an area nearby where the females are reproducing, are giving birth, right? So that site might, should, could potentially be managed differently than the other sites along our coast. Okay, now let me take you to the other species, to night smell. Um, and this is just a little bit of a, 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 a summary of what, how many fish we caught in 2021, um, which is when I had already arrived. On the x-axis now, you have the different beaches from Centerville on the southern part of the, of the county all the way to Yanasvet, um, which is in um, Del Norte County. Um, and you have catch per unit effort on the y-axis. 
This time, the different colors of the bars indicate the month at which we sampled. And first of all, you can see a very high variability in our CPUE. On average, we caught 13 fish, but it could have gone from zero to 126 fish uh, per hour per angle. The other thing you might notice is that the pattern at each beach seems to be different. At places like Lufenholz, which is in the middle, middle of your figure here, and Centerville, which is on the left side of your figure, fishes seem to be using these beaches later on in the, in the season. Well, as in places like Janusbet, which is in Del Norte, fishes seem to be using uh, this beach earlier in the season. So there looks like there's some variability um, among beaches within a year. But I'm not going to take you much farther into the uh, differences among sites. Instead, I'm going to take you to differences among the two years that we have to work with. So first of all, I'm going to talk about CPUE. Then we'll talk about length, weight, sex ratio, and age, just like we did for retics. So first, we have catch. Total catch is how they measured it in 2014. We measured it as catch per unit effort in 2021. That's what you're seeing in this first plot. And what we found was that there was way more fish in 2014 than in 2021. And that the fish were longer in 2014 than in 2021. On average, they were 125 millimeters in length. In 2014, they were under 120 20 millimeters in length in 2021. The fish were also heavier in 2014. They were about 12 grams on average in 2014 versus 10 grams in 2021. And there was a significant, uh, significantly higher proportion of females in the catch in 2014 than in 2021. So 7% of the catch in 2014 were females. Um, that's opposed to 4% of the catch, which were females in 2021. And then finally, there were also differences in the age frequency distribution between these two years, but also between sexes. So let me take you through this figure. Now you have age on the x-axis and percent of the catch on the y-axis. Um, in blues, you have the 2014 females. In reds, 2014 males. In grays, 2021 females. In yellows, 2021 males. And what we found was that in general, fishes tended to be older in 2000, 2014 than in 2021. And you can see that in our figure by the fact that the bars are much bigger in the two-year-olds for blues and reds, which are both females and males for 2014, than they were for grays and yellows, which are 2021 females and males, respectively. But you also notice that the females tended to be older in 2014, but they were again older in 2021. And you can see that, right? In blues, we have females in 2014, and in grays, we have females in um, 2021. Again, they're both smaller in the one-year-olds, the bars are smaller in the one-year-olds, and the bars in the two-year-olds are, are larger than the males. So we have differences between the years, but also between sexes, which appears to be a general pattern. Okay, so smelt were more abundant, larger, heavier, older, and there were more females in 2014 than in 2021. The qu next question is why, right? Um, one, one fairly straightforward solution might be fishing pressure, but talking to CDF and W, they have seen fewer permits go out for, for night smelt, particularly commercial fishers. Um, in fact, the number of commercial fishers has declined to about two or three people that are actively fishing these days. The next potential um, hypothesis is the presence of El Nino and the blob during 2014 through 2016 that might have wiped out the population that is now living there in 2021. Of course, the problem is we have only two data points, right? So um, it's very easy to uh, to. To, to make a straight line between these two data points, right? But it's very hard to try to estimate a pattern with only two data points. So it might have been these poor oceanographic conditions, but it might also have to do with their life history. So let me take you back to this figure that I showed you earlier, right? But instead of looking at the periods where we have data for, let me focus on the time 
before we have before we sampled in 2014 and 2021. And because fishes and the width of these bars are based on how long these fishes can live, right? Up to three years. And so to the, if we look at the time between 2011 and 2014 and between 2018 and 2021, what you can see is that the three years before 2014, the oceanographic conditions were good for fishes in the Pacific Northwest. So seafood surface temperatures were fairly low. So cold water, wave height was low. Um, spring transition was early, which is good, right? It means upwelling started early. Upwelling anomaly was negative, which is good again, right? Colder waters um, and PDO was also negative. All of these led to good ocean conditions all the way up to 2014. After that, of course, they um, went down the drain, right? Because then we had the blob and the El Nino event. But the fishes that were coming to shore in 2014 were a product of those three previous years. Now look at 2021. Water temperatures were warmer, were closer to average. Wave height was, for the most part, average. But then spring transition was late, as you can see for most of that time period. The upwelling anomaly was positive, And the PDO, especially at the beginning, was positive. It declined after that. But at the beginning of that period, was negative, was positive. Excuse me. So it could be an effect of the um, the El Nino and the blob that led to those fewer, smaller, lighter, younger fish in 2021, but it could also be oceanographic conditions previous to those years where we sampled that led to such good conditions in 2014 versus 2021. Okay, so where do we go from here with our two examples, with our two fish examples? It looks like oceanographic conditions have affected species differently, right? One is a very long-lived or a, a longer-lived species, the red-tailed surf perch, and one is a much uh, shorter-lived species, night smell. This allows for, this appears to have allowed one species to have a fairly stable population on our coast, the other one, not so much. Um, our data suggests that um, MPAs are having little benefit to red tail surf perch, but distance from towns seems to be a bigger, uh, play a bigger role um, on the populations, right? Um, and we saw this because the two distance sites, the MPA and the reference sites, tended to have larger and heavier fish and older fish than even the MPA that was close to town. Um, and our data suggests that we may need to start studying the benefits of things like um, MPAs for night smelt, right? Because we were not able to do that during this project. And because of how poor those, um, these fish are doing, the night smelt, I mean, and how variable our oceanographic conditions are these days, um, we might need to tweak the regulations for night smelt. Basically, right now, you can catch um, a bucket full for recreational fishers every day. And then the other, issue we have noticed on our, on our neck of the woods is that there's very little MPA outreach. We have found recreational fishers in fishing in MPAs, and it's because they don't know they're fishing in MPAs. The moment we tell them, they move out of the MPAs to go fishing in the many other places they can. So some form of um, outreach and education, we think would go a long way to helping these MPAs be more successful. Okay. So how are we building out our programs? So we recently got funded for this program. Um, it's uh, titled Improving Climate Change Resilience by Increasing Capacity for Northern California Tribal Fisheries. And so the objective of this, as the title says, right, is to develop fisheries research and monitoring capability as a way to increase re the resilience of our communities to climate change. We're working with a lot of the same partners uh, for which we did in these two projects that I've told you about. So the Tolowa and the Rasigini Rancheria, um, CDFNW, Southwest Fisheries Science Center, and Sea Grant, but we're expanding to five tribes. So we're um, the Trinidad Rancheria, uh, Blue Lake Rancheria, and the Wea tribe have all agreed to participate in this project. Um, the way that we're working, our structure, our organization, is it all emanates for, from the tribal nations. They have selected the species they wanna work on and the locations they wanna study at 
Um, they're being supported by the funds that the project is providing in order to hire technicians and interns, graduate students. Um, they're providing time for us to coordinate the project and they're bring, we're bringing in scientific advisors. And these data would then flow out to the, um, uh, the community in the form of the tribal council, the local communities, the sport fishers, tourists, resource managers, managers, students, and scientific community. And just to give you a little bit more information, right, um, for our previous project, we were working with Night Smelt and Red Tail Surf Perch in Del Norte and Humboldt counties, and we're expanding that those species to all of these others, including not just smelt, but also salmonids, um, and not just fish, but also some invertebrates like razor clams, mussels, kelp, red urchin, and apple. Okay, I feel like I've talked a lot. I will stop there and I apologize. I haven't left a lot of time for questions, but um, if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to try to answer them. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, if anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to raise your hand and, and I will call on you. So I have I have a question, Jose, while people are sort of formulating some questions for you. Um, I know that this um, that this project had lots of participants, you know, you went over the participants in the beginning, graduate students and undergraduates. Um, and I'm assuming that this was funded through the Sea Grant Pathways um, recent call. So I was curious, um, do the students who are in the undergraduate students who are involved in it, do they are they largely getting research experience or do they also have sort of their own independent projects within the larger project? Sure, and let me, so the Knightsville project was funded by a California um, Sea Grant new faculty um, mm -hmm. uh, fund. And then the new project, and I forgot to, I, I forgot to click the last button so that the, their logo came up. The new program is being funded by the University of California Office of the Presidents. Got it, okay. Climate change resilience grants that were um, just made available. Um, and the idea is that, yes, the undergraduates would have their own independent project um, that would fuel the graduate research projects. Um, I mentioned that the new program would have, uh, would include funding for grad students. We're actually hiring five graduate students, one for each tribal nation. Um, and so they would have their own intern or interns, depending on our funds. Um, that could help the graduate student, but also have their own independent project. Um, because you already know this, right? But um, that sense of uh, ownership is so important to help empower undergraduate students. So um, uh, yes, definitely, it's, it's, it's one of our big tools, right, that, that we use to, to help them grow. Any other questions from other folks? Oh, I thought All right, I it went super long. Yeah, Roxanne. Sorry, I was trying to figure out the meeting. Thank you for your talk, Jose. Um, I guess my question is a little more directed on kind of how your new project um, has created these collaborations. I was up in Humboldt and able to talk to the Yurok tribe um, just kind of generally. It was a, on a NRT trip. Um, unfortunately, we weren't able to talk with any of the fishery biologists that they have and also in their collaborations, but I was just kind of curious on, I know sometimes it's difficult to make those connections with them and just kind of how you were able to build those relationships. I'm sure, I'm sure it wasn't just you and it was kind of the community kind of building this over a couple of years, but kind of like anything you have to say to kind of talk, to talk about that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Thank you for your question. That's, that's, that is a great question and it, and it is very difficult. It takes time. Um, and it is a community effort for sure. So my um, predecessor, Dr. Uh, Tim Mulligan, had started to develop these relationships with the Tolowa um, Deni Nation. And so he introduced me to Rosa Lauchi, who is their, uh, the head of their fisheries program. And it kind of snowballed from there. Um, it, Rosa asked the Resigini to come in to participate, and they invited another tribe, and so on. And so that's how we've gotten to get to um, five tribal nations. 
We're also collaborating with the UROC on another project, um, looking at fish communities in the climate um, estuary. And again, it's the same thing. Um, one of the uh, one of their senior fisheries biologists, um, Keith Parker, um, was a, is a graduate of our program, both undergraduate and master's. So um, those human connections come in really handy and important um, when developing these relationships. If I may point out to a mistake that's often made, um, and I'm sure you already know this, it's coming in at the last minute before you submit a grant and you know calling them and say, hey, can I put your name in uh, because it will increase my chances of getting a grant. It is a huge, it's very disrespectful to do it that way, right? We don't wanna be parachute scientists and that's definitely one way in which you'll, you, yes, you, it will, it will, it won't be a good way to get started with those relationships. So de developing the relationships, the human connections, and really understanding what they want and not what we want is really important. Um, and what I mean by that is, right, um, we as scientists are often, we are trained to take the lead and to make decisions for ourselves. But in this case, in, in these community-based uh, research projects, it just can't be what we want and what we're interested in, right? What we're curious on. It also has to be what they need um, for their uh, communities. And so being very careful to include what they need in our, in our research project, really important for those developments. I hope I answered your question. Yes, you did. Thank you so much. Um, that's kind of what we heard kind of from the, the leaders on that group um, prior to talking to them. And so um, it was like kind of eye opening in that and also just really great to talk to them. But it's cool to see that these projects are going on and the fact that you were able to increase how many uh, tribes you're working with is really cool. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from folks? Thank you. Okay, well, I think uh, if there are no other questions, uh, we can thank Jose for tuning in with us to give us such a great talk. Uh, we really appreciate you coming or you know co coming <laughs> to talk with us uh, about your research and also, I mean, I really definitely want to talk to you more about some of the programs that you've created at Humboldt. I know that at Coast you talked about the La Scala program and. I remember I looked into it and then, you know, saw that, of course, of course it costs money and that CSUMB is not super excited to always spend money on things. That's where I am, but I'd love to talk to you more about that program. Um, and it was great to, to get to see you again. I hope everybody enjoyed your talk. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and that's why we created Creando Conciencia because we ran out of money, basically. So yeah. Like yeah, yeah, I think that was the, uh, just to, especially in this budget moment in the CSU. Yeah. It's kind of a non-starter, but maybe maybe they'd send me to Humboldt, you know. <laughs> well, and the so it's kind of a catch twenty-two, right? Because we are in a budget crunch, but at the same time, we are enrollment is also down. Um, yes. And the time when our enrollment at Humboldt was going up was when the number of Latinx students coming to us was also increasing. Mm -hmm. So the argument we're making is, well, if we want to raise enrollment, maybe we should improve the environment for, you know, high context culture students so that they yep. feel welcome. And then they, you know, they attract other students to, to, yep. to come to. And so, I think, yeah, it's the sort of thinking about truly being a Hispanic serving institution and not a Hispanic enrolling institution. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Jose. It was great to have you here and thank we'll you. let you go. And uh, everybody else, thanks for joining us for seminar this week.